You good in here already? Amen. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. You know, I bet I've heard him sing that song 75, maybe 80 times, and I never get tired of it. And I, know, I don't think I've ever heard it the same way twice of you. That's good, though. It's all good. That's exactly right. It is really good. I tell you something, that boy's got a heart for the Lord. He surely does. Well, well we'll go ahead and, and stand here. But I want to say this. In spite of his wife being here, I'm taking votes to vote me in and vote Mike out. <laughs> I promise to never preach over 30 minutes in the evening. I'll get you out of here early. I'm politicking. It's time for the, it's, that's what time of season it is. It's politicking. See, I'm just kidding. I, I'm just kidding. Y'all got a good pastor. You got a good pastor, and I love him. He, he's been a good friend to me. And uh, I tell you what, he's, he's prays for you. He spends time on his knees for you. He spends time in this book for you. You ought to, you ought to spend time praying for him. You ought to love him. You ought to take care of him. He's a good man. He's a good pastor. I think the world, Brother Mike. All right, Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read one verse. The last verse in, in Matthew chapter 5, as a matter of fact. Right. Going to be rough for a minute. <laughs> but it's going to be all right. All right. We got a perfect Bible, and this perfect text reads. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Amen. Father, I want to thank you for loving us the way you do. I want to thank you, Lord, that when all I could do was stand and cry, unworthy, unworthy, you said, I'll save you. Amen. Lord, I thank you that you'd save anybody. I'm proof of that. God, I thank you that you use your word to speak to the hearts of those that you want to speak to. I ask you to do that today. I ask you to get down into the hearts, Father. Touch them. Speak to these folks the way you want to speak to them. God, I can't do anything but just stand here and be your mouthpiece. And I pray that you'd use me for that tonight. I love you, Lord. Now speak to your people through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'll tell you. When the power of God gets to move, and I'm a big, fat, blubbering baby, and I can't help it. And I don't care. I really don't. I was the coldest, meanest, nastiest, cruelest human being that ever lived until God saved me. And the first thing He did was He gave me tears. Amen. Ah, I left my water. Now, we'll need this for him done. You know, I'm going to start like Dean McNeese would. By a show of hands, how many out here know you're not perfect? Hallelujah. That saves you 35 minutes of preaching right there. That's what Dean McNeese say. You know, he'd make a point and he'd get past that. I know we're not perfect, but you know what he's talking about right there? I believe, and if you go back and kind of read, he's talking about, for if you love them which love you, what reward have you? Do not even the publicans do the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? What he's talking about is our love for one another. Jesus Christ said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. We all, well now, in our, what, what he's talking about being perfect, he's not telling us to be perfect. He knows us. But in our love for one another, we ought to be perfect. And that's what that verse is talking about. Now, having said that, I understand we're not perfect. And you all understand you're not perfect because everybody raised their hand in here, which was smart. Now, I do want to talk about what we do have that's perfect. And my wife, when I was studying this, I was so excited about this message. And she didn't get to hear me preach it the first time I preached it. And she came tonight and I don't know if it's going to go the same way it went the first time or not, but it probably won't. But I'll tell you this, we've got a perfect God. You know, we have a perfect 
God. God cannot be tempted with sin. God cannot be tempted with evil. We Listen, God made everything and his work is perfect. Listen to what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 32. Let's just, matter of fact, let's just look at that. Let's read from, the, from verse 4. Deuteronomy 32. We're going to read from chapter 32, verses 1 through 4. He said, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to everybody. That's not just some random bunch of people. He's talking about the heavens and the earth. Give, listen, pay attention, and, I, and hear. He said, My doctrine shall drop as rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, and the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. What's well, a mouthful? That's a mouthful. Just and right is he. But Job said, shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Yes, he'll do right. He'll do right by you. He'll do right by me. He'll do right by everybody. God is perfect in his ways. He's not like man. You know, man is the only thing disobedient to God. We are the only creation that God ever made aside from a couple of angels that disobey God. Do you know if God tells that dog down the street there to bite you, you're as good as bit? God speaks and his creation obeys. He told a fish where to go to feed Peter so Peter could have money to pay his taxes for him and the Lord. He told the whale where to go to get Jonah and so he could swallow him up and teach Jonah a lesson at Whale Vomit University. Listen, everything obeys God. His creation is perfect. He created this world. It was perfect. You know what corrupted this world? Man did. We did. Everything God does is perfect. He's the rock. His work is perfect. Now listen. His, his salvation that he created is perfect. Not that I'm getting way ahead of myself. But you know what else? His way is perfect. God's way is righteousness. And do you know what he's saying? I don't have to be the old man that's inside of me. You don't have to sin. You know, I hear preachers telling this all the time. Oh, you're just doomed to sin. You're going to sin no matter what you do. Yeah, you probably will, but you don't have to. You make a solid choice in every minute of every day. What are you going to do? You're going to live in sin. You're going to live a righteous, holy life. And you can. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave you that power. He said we have everything that we need in this life and the one to come through him that loved us. That's, the, that's what we have. Amen. We don't have to sin. You do not have to sin. But we do. But God's way is righteousness. And I'll tell you something else. Listen to what he said in 2 Samuel 22, 31. His way is by the book. The Bible says as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. Amen. It's by his book. You want to live righteous? You want to live perfect God, the way God wants you to live? Live by his book. Amen. That's what he said to do. You know what? If, you did, if, that, if 2 Samuel 22, 31 ain't good enough for you, listen to Psalm 30, 18, 30. Identical word for word. Exactly the same verse, just in two different places. Do you know if God says something one time? What was it Daniel told the king? Because it's double the things established and you can't get away from it. That's right. If God says it exactly the same way two times, you better take heed to what he's saying because he means what he's saying. He said it in exactly the same way. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. What is a buckler? You know what a buckler is? A buckler is what a soldier wears that holds everything together. That's what God is to us. He's what holds everything together if we trust in Him. He said He's a buckler to all those that trust in Him. Amen. Not to those that don't. If they're not trusting in Him, God's not good. He's not doing you any good at all. Amen. You know, you can come to church every time the doors are open. You can read your Bible every day. But if you don't put your trust in God, He's doing you no good. He's a buckler to all those that trust in him. But his way is by the book. Do you know, I, there's a bunch of people out here that they hear, that, oh, they hear from God. Oh, I heard from God, Brother Donnie, and, and he wanted me to tell you that you ought to give me $500 tonight. I need a new suit. This one here, this is a chaps, and it's getting old. It's chapped, you know, it's old. 
beat up suit. And God told me, that's what they think. Amen. That's what they think gets out. That's what they think it is supposed to be done. But that ain't God's way. It's by the book. Amen. Do you know I can stand up here and tell you all kinds of things. If it disagrees with this right here, I'm a stupid liar. Amen. I mean, that's, I, I talk plain English, folks. It's, it's wrong if you go about away from this book. Do you know that God will never ever tell you anything in your heart God speaks to my heart does he speak to yours he speaks to us if he's God he ought to be able to talk to us but if he speaks to you I promise you it'll never deviate from what he's already said in this book you can guarantee God's word because it'll always be right listen to what he said in Isaiah in Isaiah 55 Verses 6 through 10. He said, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And let the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Let me get my, I almost turned all the way back to where I started from. He said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You're going to try to get it there your way? You're going to try to do things your way? You're going to fall flat on your face. You're never going to make it. You're going to try to get to heaven your way? You ain't going to make it. You're going to try to live your life your way? It ain't going to work. It's going to fall apart on you. Until you decide I'm going to live God's way and do things God's way, your life is going to be in shambles. It always has been. It always will be. My wife and I can testify to that. We, talk, we heard this morning, we, our preacher preached this morning talking about marriages restored. Marriages put back together. Ours was. Ours was in shambles. It was falling apart. Why? We were doing it our way. We were going our way, not God's way. When we put it in his hands, we put it in his care and listened to what he said about how a marriage ought to be, how a man ought to lead, and how a man ought to live his life for his wife and love his wife as Christ loved the church and do those things that God said. Then our marriage came to be what it's supposed to be. That's how you do things, God's way. It's his way. Where, where was I at? He said, For as the rain cometh down, for and snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. So shall my word that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I shall please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. Listen, God is perfect in his way because he does things by the book. Amen. Listen, his will is perfect. God's will is perfect. Do you know what God's will is for you? I don't. I ain't got no idea. I, 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 I used to go to a Pentecostal church. I was saved in an Assembly of God church. And they used to come and tell you, Brother Rick, God's got a will for your life. And let me tell you what he told me to tell you. And they'd tell you what they thought God's will for your life was. Do you know how crazy that is? You know what Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, 17 says, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Amen. If you don't understand the will of the Lord, according to that verse, you're unwise. Amen. Listen, God's got a will. I can tell you right now, without a doubt, the will of God for you, Jimmy, is that your, your sanctification. Amen. He said that in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. It's the will of God that you be sanctified. He said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, it's the will of God that we be thankful. Amen. That's for everybody. That's for all of us. But I can't tell you what the will of God is for your specific things Amen. that God has called you for. God's called each one of you for something. Amen. You know, the last time, I think it was the last time I preached here, I talked about that lady in, in Chicago that picked up the Chicago phone book. It's about that thick. And called, sat down. She couldn't do anything else. She couldn't get out of the house. She was invalid. She sat down and called everybody in the Chicago phone book. And asked them if they'd been born again. Hey, you can do something. You can do something. Not one of us is too far gone. Not one of us. We can get something done if we will. So understand what the will of the Lord is. He said, be not unwise, but to be wise. He said, listen, I'll give you another will of God. This is the will of God. 
He said in Romans 12 too, he says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now I've heard people say that that's three different wills of God. The good will of God is what he'll allow you to do. You know, and the acceptable will of God, those are things that he'll allow you to do. But the perfect will of God is where he wants you to be. I don't believe that. I believe that's one will. God has one will for your life. If you're not in it, it's not good. And it's not acceptable. So I don't believe that. I've heard that taught and I just don't believe it. But, but I tell you this, I give you some more will for your life. If you want to know some more will for your life... Jesus said this, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me. All right, here we go. You want to know God's will? This is God's will. He said, This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should, I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Amen. Now how long is everlasting? How long is everlasting? God gave you everlasting life. The, day, the minute you believed on him, the minute you called upon his name, he gave you everlasting life. You're living eternal life now. Amen. Now, right now. You're not waiting for eternal life. We have it now. Amen. Now are we born again. Now are we the children of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when we shall see him, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Now are we the children of God. That's what now is. You know what else we got? We got a perfect Bible. That was, just, that was my first point. I only got eight more to go, Caleb, and we'll be done. We got a perfect Bible. Do You know I believe that. You know, you all know me here. I mean, you know what I believe about this book. This book is perfect. I have absolutely every jot and tittle that the Lord wants me to have right here in this book. I believe the commas are perfect in this book. The periods, the semicolons, everything. The titles of the pages are perfect in my Bible. Mine's perfect on the outside because it's a book. This is a battlefield book right here. Mine's camouflaged. Hey, you know what? This is a perfect Bible. Amen. I'll tell, you what, I'll tell you how you can know it. The Bible says in Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Are you simple tonight? Are you kind of simple-minded? You feel a little bit like you ain't maybe, maybe not be the smartest knife in the drawer, you know, the sharpest knife in the drawer? I always felt that way. I never graduated high school, never did nothing. I never made nothing out of my life. All I am is a no-good-for-nothing truck driver. But you know what? God taught me some things in this book. God gave me some things in this book that a truck driver shouldn't have to know. You think about that. God gave me some things in this book that I know some folks with PhDs don't understand this. I'm better than they are. I'm smarter than they are right now. He made wise the simple. Hallelujah to God. Hey, you know what, though? You think about this. The strongest verse I ever heard for the perfect Bible is Psalm 138, verse 2. The strongest verse in the whole Bible. He says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. Amen. Why? For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Amen, now, you think about the name of God. The Bible says that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee shall bow in heaven and in earth and things under the earth. Every knee shall bow to that name. God hath given him a name that is above every name. There's not one name better than the name of Jesus Christ. And he said, this book right here is above that name. Boy, that's a statement, ain't it? You think about what that means. <coughs> Listen, we got a perfect Bible, an absolutely perfect Bible. You can bank your soul on it. You can, take, you can take this book right here and you can tell anybody anything from this book and you don't have to worry about it being wrong. You don't have to worry that you're telling them something that ain't going to get them there. You don't have to worry about telling them something that ain't right because everything in this book is perfect and everything in this book is right. 
We got a perfect book, perfect Bible. You know why? Because it was given to us by a perfect Savior. Hallelujah to God, we've got a perfect Savior. You know he was born perfect? He was born without original sin. He was born the seed of the woman, the prophesied seed of the woman in Genesis 3. He was born without the cursed, tainted blood of man. He was born perfect son of God. He did not have that, that problem that we've got. He didn't, listen, he lived a perfect life. Jesus Christ never sinned one time. Let me tell you something. Look at this right here. It says, for it became him, in Hebrews 2.10, for whom are all things. Everything was made for him. And by whom are all things? Everything's made by him. Well, that's something to think about in a minute. In bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, wait a minute. Think about that verse just a few minutes. What does that sound to me? I mean, what does that sound like? He wasn't perfect first. That's what it sounded like. He had to make him perfect through sufferings. We're going to get to that in a minute. Do you know he loved perfect? Do you know Jesus Christ loved perfect? While hanging, nailed to a cross, his hands and his feet with nails driven through his hands and feet while hanging on a cross, dying in your place, dying for the ones who spit in his face, dying for the ones who striped his back, dying for the one who's put the spear through his side, dying for the two thieves on either side. He's told one of those thieves this day, Shalt thou be with me in paradise? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He loved perfect. Hey, that wasn't like me. That wasn't like me. You take me and nail me to a cross and give me power to come down and call 10,000 leagues of angels. You're in bad trouble. You believe me. He loved you perfect because he gave his life knowing that we would turn on him. He gave his life knowing that we wouldn't live like we ought to live for him. He gave his life knowing that the Jews would reject him while he was hanging there on the cross. He did all that in perfect love. You want to see a picture of love? It's a bloody cross is what it is. It's a man hanging on a bloody cross. That's the perfect picture of love. That's he loved you perfect. The Bible says in Hebrews 5 and 9, and being made perfect, again, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. He died perfect. He died perfect. He said, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was perfect when they crucified him. Amen. He never sinned one time. If he had ever sinned, if he had ever had a sinful thought, if he had ever sinned and, and thought evil of his brother, if he had ever sinned and done one thing wrong in his entire life, we could never have salvation through him. Right, he died perfect. Pilate said, I find no fault in this man. Boy, I can say amen to Pilate. It's only a Gentile I ever liked. He said, Amen. Amen, Pilate. That's right. Ain't nothing wrong with him. You can't find no fault in him. He's perfect, Pilate. He's hanging there perfect. Do you know what I, I believe all this is talking about when it says he was uh, uh, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings? Do you know Jesus Christ had to learn what it was like to live like a man? He had to learn what it was like. God doesn't know what it is to be tired. God doesn't know what it is to be thirsty. Jesus Christ hanging on the cross said, I thirst. God doesn't know what it is to be sleepy and hungry and need things. God makes things. He created everything there is. God doesn't understand that. But to make Jesus Christ perfect through suffering, he had to suffer like you and me, to be the perfect captain of our salvation. See, he was perfect already. He was perfect already. And I'm not taking anything away. Please don't, don't, don't come away with me thinking that I'm saying he wasn't perfect when he was born. Because he was. But I believe that he had to be made perfect to understand what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. He hurt like you hurt. Listen, when Lazarus died, Jesus Christ wept. He lost a friend. When he brought him back, he had the power to do that. Thank God for all that. But he lost a friend. He hurt. He understands what it's like when you lose a loved one. He hurt. He, he, he had, he had, listen, he knew what it was like to be betrayed by a friend. Amen. Judas kissed him and said, Lord, 
You know, he said, Judas, betrayest thou me with a kiss? Amen. He kissed the Lord. He kissed the face of God and went to hell. Amen, brother. You think Amen. about that a minute. Jesus Christ knew what we went through. He lived and died a perfect life. Amen. He had to suffer as a man, and he did. Do you know what he did? He gave us a perfect salvation. Amen. Perfect salvation. Amen. We don't have, listen, you can go out here in any church in this town that doesn't say Baptist on the door and 99 out of 100 of them is going to tell you you can lose your salvation. Right. 99 out of 100 of them is going to tell you you can go to hell once you've been saved. How can that happen? Listen, when you, get, when you get born again, you become part of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. How are you going to get out of the body of Christ? How, listen, he was mutilated one time. Right. One time. Listen to what Hebrews, 9, uh, Hebrews 7 and 9, 19. I'll get my tongue untied in a minute. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. How do we draw nigh to God? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's how we draw nigh to God. You dare approach unto God without blood? It's impossible. The high priest knew when he went into the temple, if he didn't come in with blood, he wasn't coming out. Amen. I mean, feet first, maybe. You know, there's a tradition among the old Jews that said that they tied a rope onto the ankle of the high priest when he went in and had bells on the bottom of his robe. And if they quit hearing the bells, they'd drag him out because he was done. He got in there and didn't do right. I don't know if that ever happened or not, but that's tradition that says they did that. But you know what? We draw nigh unto God by the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed for us and he placed on the mercy seat in heaven for us. We draw nigh unto God by that. Do you know the law could never make anything perfect? The Bible says that the law, in, in Hebrews said, for the law made nothing perfect. Do you know what the law is? The law is a mirror. The law is a mirror. You hold up a mirror. If you get close enough to that mirror, you'll see the flaws in your face. Listen, that's why I stand way back here and shave. I don't want to see what the rest of that looks like. <laughs> if you get close enough to the law, it'll show you what you are. Amen. That's all it was for. Amen. The law was made to show you that you are a sinner. Yes. Jesus Christ came to save you from being a sinner. Amen. Listen to what he said in Colossians 1.28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. In him. That's how you're perfect. That's how God sees you perfect. In Christ Jesus. Do you know the minute you get born again, you've heard me say this before, they take the book of the life of Rick Owens and put it right here, and the book of the life of Jesus Christ, and they put it right here, and they just swap the names around. And God sees me and his son as absolutely perfect. The day I got born again, I stood in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so do you. Amen. Now listen, there's unconfessed sin sometimes come between you and your fellowship will suffer. But your relationship never changes. You are always the son of God. Once you're born into the family of God, you cannot be misadopted or unadopted or thrown out or kicked out or anything else. It's perfect salvation. Listen, are you so foolish? This is Galatians. I love this verse. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Are you working your way in now? You were born again by the Spirit of God. Are you trying to work your way home now? How goofy are you is what Paul's trying to say. If, I don't know if goofy was a word back then, but if it was, I guarantee you'd use it. You know, Paul was a hillbilly. Over and over he said, y'all, you read the Bible. He said it a lot. Listen, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But then verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We ought to do those works, but those don't save you. He made it clear in Titus. He said, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy hath he saved us. Listen, when I cried for mercy, I got mercy. You can't come up here crying for justice. If you want to come up here to this bench and you want to come up here and start crying justice, oh, watch out. Amen. You don't want justice. You want mercy. Amen. That's what we need. We need mercy. Amen. We need mercy. 
I'm thankful for that mercy. Listen, if it, if it weren't for mercy, I couldn't be standing up here right now. If it weren't for mercy, I'd be down here under a bridge somewhere or dead in hell with my back broke Amen. where I deserve to be. I don't have, hey, listen, when I started this life, I started out like everybody else, just little and, and growing up, and I was the cutest little kid. I got pictures to prove it. I was pretty when I was young, don't I? I really wasn't like this when I was young. I, hey, I was happy. I grew up with a family. Everybody loved everybody. I went into dope like you wouldn't believe. I went into drugs like you would not believe. I went into things that, that you can't even understand probably. But listen, mercy came and got me. Mercy came to where I was and said, hey, I'll save even you. And he did. Listen, we have a perfect salvation. You know what? Jesus Christ is right now at this very moment preparing your perfect home in heaven. He, we have a perfect home in heaven. You know my favorite verse? Everybody here knows probably what my favorite verses are. John 14. If you start out in verse 1, he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You think about that. He's not sending an angel. He's not sending a cherubim. He's not sending nobody but himself. He's coming for you himself. If you go by the way of the grave or by the way of the rapture, it's going to be Jesus Christ be the first face you see in paradise. Anytime. Listen, it doesn't matter how you leave here. He's going to be the one to come and get you. Do you know when he comes out on the clouds, when he comes to call the church home, when the rapture of the church place, he, it's going to happen. The trump's going to sound. The, at the, when the trumpet is done, at the last trump, by the way, it says, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're not going to, it ain't going to happen that we're going to go up there and he's going to say, well, you know, I'm getting a little tired of you. I'm going to send you back. No. That ain't happening. He has a perfect place for you. It's not just, listen, I, I've got my place. He's got a mansion up there, a mansion, not a, not a room like some of these perverted Bibles say, uh, not, a, not a condo, you know. It ain't, I, I don't have a cabin, little cabin in the corner of glory land, that old stupid song they used to sing a long time ago. You know, all the wood, hay, and stubble burns, don't you, right there at the judgment seat of Christ. That's all gone. I have a mansion waiting for me with my name on it. It's prepared for me. This mansion is specifically prepared for Brick Owens. Amen. Jimmy Graham's got one. Donna, you got one. Caleb, you got one. We've all got one if we got born again. He has a place prepared for us. Listen to this. In Revelation 21, we're almost there. Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Listen, we're in a veil of, sour, a veil of sorrow in this world right now. We lose people every day. We lose, hey, folks, I can't tell you how many people I love are in heaven right now. In the last six months, we've lost some of the dearest people to my soul. We have lost people in our church. That one lady in particular, I'm telling you, I loved her. I mean, I loved her so much. She was like my own grandmother. We lost like Brother Gary Sharp. I don't know if y'all ever knew Gary or not, but I loved Gary Sharp to death. I loved him to pieces. Me and him talked all the time. He always, always cut up with me. He always pat me down. Every time I'd come in, he'd do a search on me there, make sure whether I was packing or not. Old Brother Gary Sharp. I love that man. You know, I'll get to see him again. Amen. I'll see him again. Do you know we'll never part again? Well, there'll, be, there'll be no more. Hey, 
these bad knees I got right here, I won't have to have half step up that thing right there. I can leap across this thing. Amen. You know, Berman Cape, we were talking about him this morning. No brother Berman Cape, when he was in his 80s at Temple Baptist Church, could come in there and preach. And I watched him get excited and take that leg and throw it up on here, up here on top of the pulpit, him in his 80s. I'm lucky to be able to stand up behind it in my 50s. Hey, we get a brand new body up there. His, in verse 5, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Amen. Like I said a while ago, you can put your soul in this book. You can bank your soul on this Bible. We've got a lot of things that are perfect. You know, I'm not a perfect preacher. That's for sure. Everybody knows that. Anybody's listened to me for any length of time. The last time I preached, just like spit my teeth out almost halfway down the congregation. <laughs> it come me, I come that close to losing them. <laughs> Do you know there's a sad part to this message? There is a sad part to this message. And I hate to, I, I hate to kick people once you get them all smiley face, but you know what? There's a perfect punishment for those that reject God's Son. Listen, if you reject the perfect Savior, a perfect salvation, a perfect God, a perfect home in heaven, you deserve to go to hell. And you get there, you will wind up, you will have to say amen to your own damnation. And that's a sad thought to me. But there is. Heaven is just as real as hell. Hell was preached more by our Savior than by anybody in the entire book. I don't like to preach on hell. I hardly ever do. And, and God knows my heart about it. I don't want to leave anything out. I don't want to not preach the whole counsel of God. And I will. If he tells me to preach on hell, I'll preach on hell. I'll preach it so hot you can smell the smoke. But I'm going to tell you something. I'd rather preach on those things that he has for us waiting. I'd rather preach on those things that God wants us to have that perfect fellowship, that perfect love for one another that he told us to have right there in verse 48. He wants us to love each other. He wants us to understand each other better. Do you know Baptists are the worst in the world to shoot their wounded? We're the worst in the world for that. Listen, go home. We, we love you. Hug your neck. Talk about how good you are in church. Go home and eat you for lunch. That's a, that ought not to be. That ought not to be. I can't help but testify on myself. Me and my wife and Jeff Peach went home one day after church, and we were sitting there, and, and we weren't really bad-mouthing somebody real, real bad, but we were talking about some folks in the church. And we, we didn't even give it a thought. But we were talking about some folks in the church. And the preacher got up there preaching, and the way we sat on that side of the church, I said about where you're sitting, well, actually, that's where my wife sat, and I sat next to her, and Jeff always sat right there. And the way the preacher stood, it was right in line, just like this, right across <laughs> Jeff, right to me and to her. And he says, and y'all, he says, y'all get out there, and you talk about how much you love everybody in the church, and when you go home, you have them for lunch. <laughs> and it was like... <laughs> <laughs> Amen, brother. Old Jeff turned over, looked over his shoulder at me, and went... Carol says, do you think the preacher was in the kitchen? <laughs> hey, ain't none of us perfect. But do you know we ought to love each other more than that? We ought to love each other more than that. Do you know what? We made a vow that day, didn't we? We made a vow that day. We're not going to eat. We're not going to have them for lunch no more. And I'll tell you what, the next time I preached after that, when I got in the pulpit at Temple Baptist Church, I told them right there, if you want to talk to me about somebody in this church, you come to me and say, well, let me tell you about Jimmy Graham. I'm going to take you, and we're going to go to Jimmy Graham and find out. Amen. Ain't nobody said another word to me about nobody in that church. I don't know what goes on in Temple Baptist Church, and I don't even care. I don't want to know. Do you know why? Because I can love them that way. I can love them that way. I don't have to know everything goes on behind the scenes. I can love them. Amen. I can pray for them. And I, I'm going to tell you something. Honest in my heart, I don't have anything in my heart against anybody right now that God could hold against me. Not one thing. And I can say that with, with I'm behind the pulpit and God knows me. Uh -huh. Listen, we ought to love each other. Right. We ought to care about one another. You ought to pray for each other. You ought to build each other up. 
Don't tear each other down. But listen, if you ain't been born again today in this church, I don't know who is and who ain't. I'm hoping everybody is. I'm hoping that because I want to see all of you. Because I got a brand new mansion over there. I'm going to show it off a little bit when y'all get there. We'll go. I'll show you where. I guarantee you I got a big old gun safe like you won't believe in mine. <laughs> Probably as wide as that back wall. Lord knows me. You know how it's it. Hey, it's heaven. I told a guy at one time, I said, you know what? We'll play golf. I said, when we get up there, we'll play, we'll play on the first two weeks. We'll go play golf when we get there. He says, I don't play golf. I said, you will. It's heaven. <laughs> I mean, you're going to be perfect. But I ain't played golf in 10 years. But listen, if you ain't born again, why ain't you born again? What in this world is worth your soul? What in this world is worth your soul? What would you give in exchange for your soul? What could be worth dying and going to hell and burning for all out eternity? When Jesus Christ has a perfect home waiting for us. When God himself wants to fellowship with us. God, it says he'll live with us. And be our God and we'll be his people. You remember Adam walking with God in the garden in the cool of the day? He's going to restore that relationship. And we'll be able to walk with our God in the cool of the day. And he'll talk to us and he'll tell us, do you know we'll understand? You know we sing that song, we'll all understand it better by and by. Do you know you'll have perfect knowledge? You'll have perfect knowledge one day. You won't have to ask God why he did something. You'll know why he did it. You'll know exactly why he did it. And you'll say amen. Thank you, God. I needed that. Well, when you whipped me back there, I remember when you whipped me that time, I needed that. I remember when you made me come to the altar and I didn't really want to get out of that seat. I didn't want everybody to see me get up and go. And I was ashamed that, oh, you know, I might cry when I got down there and talked to you. Don't bother none of us no more. We won't have no fear. We won't have none of that. We'll have a perfect relationship with a perfect God. How's yours tonight? How's yours? We're going to pray. And, and Caleb, if you want to sing something or however you want to do this, I, I don't know how. We ain't got no piano player, so we're going to give a, a song of invitation. We'll let Caleb 